of the series is called Devoted, and we're looking at um, the book of Acts and how the author, of course, which is Luke, the doctor, wrote the book of Acts and also the gospel of Luke and describing the early church. I want you to open your Bible to Acts chapter 2, and starting in verse 41 and 42. If you don't have one, I'm going to have one there on the screen, and uh, if you have one, it's better that you could open your own Bible, of course, either a digital copy or a, uh, a hard copy. So whichever works. And let's all read the scripture together. It says there, those who accepted, okay, I'm going to wait for some. They're still looking. It's fine. Okay. So, we're going to so those who accepted this message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Please join me in a word of prayer. But we're asking the Lord today to speak to us. Even though as we look at your word today, I pray as we look at, uh, Lord, uh, the four Peters as their New Testament church started, I pray that we would understand what it means, that we would even, Lord, practice this, Lord, as a spiritual community. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is the last portion of our series, and we have talked about, again, what does it mean to be devoted? Devoted means to be committed, to be dedicated. If you open your Bible, you will see that in Acts chapter 1, of course, Jesus is reminding his disciples that they should wait for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. They were so excited about the coming of the kingdom. And they were asking Jesus, Jesus, when are you going to restore the kingdom of God? And Jesus said that it's not the time yet and you should not know. But yet, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait because the next few days, you will receive or the Holy Spirit will come down and you will receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And then Acts 1, 8 says, but you will receive power and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then you continue reading because there were about 120 people then in Acts chapter 2, they, they began to pray. So while they were praying, of course, the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, starting on verse 1, you would read that. And there's the mighty rushing of the wind and tongues of fire rest on the people and they began to speak in tongues and then you read the story in Acts chapter 2 Peter began to preach it's interesting because Peter you know the cowardly Peter who disowned Jesus three times now is empowered ready to preach in thousands of people this is called Pentecost Pente meaning 50 50 days after the Passover the Feast of Weeks everybody was there it's a great fiesta of course uh, or a celebration and a fiesta for us, and 3,000 people were saved. I want you to think about that. 120 people, and now there are 3,000. Huge jump, amen? amen? People, just 120 people, and then suddenly the next day there were 3,000 people. And you read the text, those who accepted his message, he preached the gospel. He preached about Jesus dying on the cross. And then after that, we're baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The people who were baptized were grown up people, not babies. Because they understood the message. Baptized means baptizo. They were immersed in water. Imagine that. 3,000 people getting baptized. That's a long baptism. <laughs> we're going to have seven people who are going to be water baptized today. Come on, let's give God a praise for that. <laughs> and trust me, it's going to run around about 20 minutes, but imagine baptizing 3,000 people in one day. And uh, if there's a tub, we have a tub outside, imagine 3,000 people with a tub. Oh, it's going to look, it's not going to look good after. We have to replace every 100 people pretty much. So imagine if you're the 3,000 and you're turning the tub. Okay. <laughs> Of course, they were baptized, and here's what it says, they devoted. After that, Luke wrote, they said, they devoted, the church, the people of God. The church is the people, not the building. They devoted themselves, what? Devoted means what? They committed, they're dedicated in this four to the apostles' teaching. What is that? Again, the word of God. Apostles' teaching, because again, the apostles were the 12 that Jesus chose. They were the first who heard the teaching of Jesus, and now they're passing it on to the new believers. The New Testament that you hold right now is a compilation of that apostles' teaching. It was canonized from the what? The Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is the life, the ministry of Jesus Christ. 
his death and resurrection, and then you move on. There's like personal letters from Paul and what they call epistles, a letter to the churches. That's what you read. You read what? Colossians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, a letter addressed to the church, addressing some issues. Again, what? Using the apostles' teaching, using the words of Jesus to address some issues in church. You know why? Because the church is not perfect. If you're looking for a perfect church, you're in the wrong place. Look at the person sitting right next to you. Look, look, come on, look. Mm -hmm. See, you're in the wrong place. Because that person is not perfect, trust me. Amen? Because some people say, I'm looking for a perfect church, and then they move to another church. The moment you arrive in that church, it's no longer perfect. Because you're there. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't get offended. And then after that, to fellowship. And again, what is fellowship? It's not just hanging out together because we use this a lot as a Christian. Oh, we're going to have a fellowship. Oh, we're going to have some drinks. We're going to go talk. So usually fellowship means hang out. But the word in Greek is koinonia. It's more than that. It's sharing together. It's participating together in a way that has a purpose and has a meaning and it also that glorifies the Lord. Amen? So it's not just gathering, it's not just hanging out, it's not just watching Netflix together. Oh, we're going to have a fellowship. What are you going to do? We're just going to go eat. No, you're just eating. You're not having a fellowship. So the Bible describes that if you read, you know, after 40, actually 42, 42, it said they broke bread, they ate, they worship, they pray. Actually, that's what it is. And to the breaking of bread, we did it last week. It's quite different because, again, in our culture, breaking of bread is just you and God, you know, and this whole personal relationship that we kind of like as Western philosophy and thinking is all about you and your personal walk with God. Read the Bible. There's no such thing. It's all about walking together with people. All of those apostles teaching they did it together fellowship they were together breaking of bread they were doing it together not alone read first corinthians 10 first corinthians 11 paul was writing to the church in Corinth. actually they were what paul was warning them because they were enjoying the breaking of the bread so much the people are going ahead of the others some people take it to the next level they're getting drunk because they love the wine Imagine, in communion, people are, hey girl, praise the Lord. Amen. Paul says, ah, that's why you call it what? The Lord's Supper or communion. What is it, communion? Common union. The common union that we have when we partake that is Christ. Not because of our skin tone, not because of your accent, not because of where you came from. The common union is Christ. So that we could partake it together. And we did that last week. And what a powerful moment when we did it in groups. The Holy Spirit came down. The grace of the Lord was felt. Some of you, while you were what, doing that, you were crying. It's because for the first time, really, we were remembering what he has done together with other people. And now we're going to talk about prayer. So simple, but yet so misunderstood by a lot of people. Prayer. What comes into mind when you hear the word prayer? I'll tell you mine. I grew up in the Philippines. Prayer. I hated prayer because my mom would force me to pray. I don't want to pray. I have memorized prayers. I just want to finish because it's either five of those and two Hail Marys. The goal is just to finish, but not actually have a conversation with the Lord. The goal is just to have a monologue. Here's what I realized. Prayer is a dialogue. How many of you just prayed and after that you're done and you're like, you didn't even wait for the Lord to speak to you? I thought it's a dialogue. Lord, thank you, Lord. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. But when you pray, Lord, thank you. My old wife loves to pray. She's an intercessor. So we pray individually in the morning, at night we pray together. She prays, she prays long. <laughs> really, when she prays, I Lord, thank you, Jesus. And then after that, I would, I would have to confess. In some occasions, I've fallen asleep. 
proverbs, right? <laughs> and then after that, of course, I woke up like, amen, amen. She said, nah, I, well, I finished an hour ago. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Prayer. I want to look at a dialogue. I think it's a dialogue, right? So here's some questions that we're going to answer as we look at this because they devoted to this. And when you look at this, they devoted to what? They, their devotion is Jesus. Their devotion is to Jesus' teaching. Their devotion is to Jesus' people. Their devotion is to what? Remembering what Jesus has done. And their devotion is lifting up. They're what? Talking to Jesus. Here are some few questions that we're going to answer. We're going to be quick here. Number one is this. What is prayer? What is really prayer? And next, what does it mean to be devoted to prayer? Are you ready? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Okay, what is prayer? There are many descriptions about prayer. Here's the most simple one. Prayer is simply talking to God. Amen? Let's not complicate this. You could either pray, sitting down, standing up, kneeling, different postures in prayer, but you simply talk to the Lord. So if this is a conversation, it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue, then that means if you're talking to the Lord, then he's going to respond to you. But the problem with prayer is this, because we've been preconditioned to pray and just to memorize some prayer and not to set our hearts to hear from God. Because we pray, because we just wanted to just unload everything to the Lord, and mostly when we pray, haven't you noticed that it's mostly what we want and what we need? The Bible says, you know, from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, to be honest with you, if I want to look at the priority of your life, I just need to look at the priority of your prayer. What do you pray for? And here's what I realize. If we're not going to study about prayer, here's what's going to happen. I'm just going to be praying about me, what I need, what I want. I'm not saying that's bad. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And mostly when you read that, it was a corporate prayer. They were praying together. And here's what I realized. It's so awkward. You're praying together and you're praying just about yourself. Imagine praying with someone. Like, for example, Nara, Nate, and me will be praying. And then, Lord, thank you, Lord, that I love you, God. And when I pray, that it's a, I'm not even talking about them and what they want, what I want, what they want to be prayed for. It's just about me. And why did you include me in this prayer group? <laughs> And Lord, thank you, God, because you love me, God. And thank you, Lord, I need a new car, I need a new... Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. That's, are you okay? Okay, we pray. No, you pray. Corporate prayer, always being together. We have to watch out, because this culture that we have right now is pushing toward individualism so much. That it's about me, about self-care, about what I feel. I'm not saying that's not important, but read your Bible. It's never about you. Jesus said, if you want to be a disciple, deny yourself. But yet the culture is about self. But Jesus said, deny yourself. Here's the next one. Take up your cross. That means, are you ready to die? Oh, we love to watch other people's cross, but not ours. You're not carrying your cross, but have you been carrying your cross? And then follow me. Guess what? If you want to follow Jesus, other people are following him as well. It's not just you. That's the whole personal walk. Yes, but not totally true. I'm walking with others. That's why we're so quick to push relationship away, because it's my personal walk. But other people are walking with Jesus too. Jesus loves others, not just you. Look at the person sitting right next to you. Come on, look at that person. God loves that person too. And then you're looking at me like, really, Pastor? Yes! <laughs> so the next question is, what does it mean to be devoted to prayer? What does it mean? It said they devoted themselves what? to prayer. What does that mean? First, let's look what it is not first. Being devoted to prayer doesn't mean that, here's the first one, Prayer is all that you do. Because that's what we think. Devoted to prayer is that means every time you're praying. Every moment. Yeah, the Bible, Paul says pray without ceasing. But it doesn't mean like everything. Every, so then you're not going to be able to do anything. 
That's not what it means. Right? So for us, it's the quantity of prayer. But I have done that. But it has never affected me. I prayed before morning, lunch, and dinner. But yet it's not the quantity. I think it's the posture of our heart. You could have the 9 o'clock habit, uh, the 3 o'clock habit. You could have the 9 p.m. habit. But if you're just having a monologue with the Lord, you're just doing some religious calisthenics. It's not prayer, just all you do. Next is that praying only during hardships and difficulties. Oh, I'm devoted to prayers when you have problems. You see that in, you know, when you, you see this in buildings, right? There's some, you know, uh, uh, breaks the, break the glass in case of emergency, some fire extinguishers, and some fire hose. And what's that? So just in case there's an emergency, usually that's what happens in prayer. Right? So you don't talk to God until it's a 911. Right? So here's the next one. It doesn't mean that what? Praying only during meals. Or thank you for this food. And you're in a hurry. You're not even thinking the moment. But then after you're there, you're doing this thing again. That's after you look down and did we just pray? You just prayed about 20 seconds ago. And you look at yourself, wow, look at me, man, I'm so devoted to prayer. Three times a day. And for some of you, five times a day, because you eat a lot. <laughs> you have brunch, you know, breakfast, brunch, lunch, of course, snacks, and then dinner and midnight snack. Wow, okay. But look at this. This is... When you look at the example of the New Testament, I'm going to bombard you with some examples in the, in the book of Acts for us to get an idea of what's happening here in prayer. And then we're going to answer the question, okay? What does it mean to be devoted in prayer? Let's look at this one. The New Testament church gathered and assembled to pray. If you want to read your Bible, you can walk with me on, on this. So you can open your digital Bible and also your physical Bible, which is great. So you could look at this. The first time that they prayed, actually when they gathered, the first one was for guidance in Acts chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. When Judas died, they were praying for guidance for them, but to choose the next apostle. And Matthias was chosen. Let's read this. It says, then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which, which, uh, which of these two you can choose. You have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. That's the first one. The book of Acts, they prayed for direction. They were praying, Lord, choose which is the next apostle. The next one, as you continue to read, not only that, also they prayed for, for courage and boldness. At this time, when what? Peter? Um, let, let's just read. Now the Lord, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant. So they were arrested. Remember, they were praying for the invalid man, uh, the crippled man, the beautiful gate. And then after that, silver and gold, I have none. Rise up in the name of Jesus. The Sanhedrin, which the religious council, arrested them. And this is the prayer of the church. All of these are corporate prayer, not individual prayers. That was their prayer. They're praying for boldness. They were not praying, okay, for the release of the apostles. They were praying for the boldness for the gospel to be preached. For us, when we get arrested, what's your first prayer, Lord? Take me out of the dark, my Lord. I don't want to be there. That's not the prayer. They were like, Lord, give them more boldness. Give them more courage to preach the word. What a prayer. It's not a bailout prayer. So they were praying for courage or boldness. Next, to set the new leaders in Acts chapter 6. Because again, the tension between the Hebraic Jews and also the Hellenistic, Hellenistic Jews. This is the first time that they have felt because of the 3,000 people and more people are being added. So there was an overlook into a certain uh, groups in church. And look at this. And they prayed. They presented them with these men to the apostles. They chose them who prayed and lay hands, laid their hands on them. The apostles prayed for these leaders. 
Let's move on. Not only that, for breakthroughs. You want breakthroughs? The church was praying. Not personal breakthroughs to me, to mind you. Look at Acts chapter 8. Here's what happened. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and, and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. You need to understand what was going on here. Because again, what was the, when the Holy Spirit would come, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Samaritans are kind of like the Jews didn't like them because they represent a compromise for them because these are the Jews that have intermarried with the Gentiles. So the Jew would look down upon these people, but yet the Holy Spirit was moving. Here's the prayer. They went there. And look at what happened here. Verse 16. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they have been baptized in water. Peter and John was sent to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. For Peter and John, this is huge. Because for them, they have, some of them, that they have not even set foot in some area. But they prayed. How many of you here praying for breakthrough? Don't pray alone. You need people to pray with you. There's so much power when we come in prayer together. Next, in times of challenges. So here's what happened, of course. Persecution is breaking out. Peter was arrested. And here's the prayer here. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Who's praying? Not individual, but the church was praying. Here's the next one. The commission workers. What do you mean? Because again, this is now the apostles going to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 13 in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon called Niger, actually the whole church history that was his name is Niger is because the first black church leader. That's him. Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Look at this, verse 2. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, again, look at this. Of course, they're praying because they're fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. In the moment of worship and prayer and fasting, the presence of the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Again, praying together, not alone. Hmm. Of course, we can talk about Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 16, but I think I already made my point. Prayer is part of the New Testament church life. They prayed together constantly. They were devoted in the most challenging moment. When they're setting leaders, when there's a need in church, they are praying. And here's what happened to us. When we have challenges, when we, uh, we face persecution maybe, here's the enemy's uh, tactics is that to isolate you and just let you pray alone. There's something about praying together we need to understand. They devoted themselves to prayer. It's something that is normal for them. So now that being said, so the question now is this. What does it mean to be dedicated to prayer? Here's the answer as we look at all of those verses. Quick, 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 simple. First one is prayer is a priority. That's what it means. They devoted themselves to prayer. That means prayer is a priority in the spiritual community, in the New Testament church. They were serious about praying. It was a priority for them. In every moment that they have faced challenge, they pray. The question is this, is it a priority for you? It seems like when you look at the four, the prayer part is the one that's being dropped. Oh, I love reading the word. I love, you know, fellowshipping. I think you, know, you look at the four, apostles teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. I think if we're going to rank that in the way we respond as a, minister, as a church is this. We love fellowship. 
Because we always have to what? We love to hang out together. We love to eat together. But yet, maybe word? No, maybe what? Breaking of bread because we only do it once a month. And you get to eat and drink the cup. <laughs> then maybe number three would be the word. And the last one is prayer. Because here's the life of the enemy. It's not that powerful. Why waste your time? But actually, this is powerful. Because when you pray, you're actually declaring that, Lord, I need you. And I can't do it on my own. You're saying to God, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you in humility and I'm declaring to them my total dependence on you. That's why it's hard to pray. How many of you know this? How many of you here, you made a decision, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray every morning at 9 o'clock or I'm going to pray every 12 noon. Come on, you made that decision. And then when you started praying, I'm like, you forget, number one. Number two is when you started praying. And you look at your watch most of the time. Lord, thank you very much. And then after that, oh, just one minute. Oh, I felt forever. <laughs> and then you said, I'm going to pray 15 minutes every day. And then you started, Lord, thank you. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you are uh, magnanimous. You are magnificent. And then you look, only 30 seconds. I have nothing to say. <laughs> and then you stop, Lord. Amen. Okay. So, but of course, when you watch your Korean telenovela, you, you know, you could discuss that all day. You know, you watch the new series, oh, you know, there you know. But no, you have nothing to say before the Lord. You just go there right now. Oh, thank you, you love me. I love you, you love me. We're a happy family. <laughs> Interesting when we are with men, mighty men, you know, athletes and great men. You ask them to pray. Bro, let's pray. Huh? I don't know how to pray. Yeah. Yeah. This man, confident, you know, speakers, and let's pray. Bro, you're going to need to pray. No, I don't know how to pray. What do you mean? You don't know how to talk? <laughs> you don't know how to have a conversation. Oh, that's how it is? Yeah, just have a conversation with yeah. Yeah. It's not that you don't know. Yeah. It's this. Because you have not really prayed. Yes. It's like talking, that's like having a, well, having a conversation with my wife. I can't say, no, I don't know how to talk to you. <laughs> no, I said, well, you don't know how to talk to me. You will try. You remember when you were courting your spouse? You will try. Uh, 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 all the men? All the men? Amen. Even though, you know, sometimes you can't understand. Yeah. Just a whole lot of things, you know. And then, especially when you ask, how are you? Well, you better not. You better be ready for that. How are you? It'd be a whole lot of things. For men, it's just simple. How are you? Great. <laughs> that means that's really great. When we say, how are you? Not great. We're not really not great. Now, if he wants to explain, it might be a little bit difficult for us because we can't figure it out as well. But we're not great. For women, I'm okay. How are you? Great, but not really great. <laughs> That's where you pray. Lord help me. <laughs> this, this very moment, I need your power. <laughs> anyway, prayer is a priority. They were serious about praying. They're persistent in their prayer. In every season and moment of the church, they were praying. I can read more if you want to. Here's what I realized. The truth is, is this. We don't struggle with prayer. Yeah, let me tell you the truth. We don't struggle with prayer. But we struggle with our priority. Let me say that again. We don't struggle with prayer. We struggle with priority. Because you could have a conversation. It's just your priority is not set. Let me just read this quote from R.C. Sproul. And here's what he wrote here. Here's what he said. We always choose according to our strongest inclination at the moment of choice. We always choose according to our strongest inclination at the moment of choice. So that means it's not that you don't want to pray. It's not just, it's not your priority. 
Because you're choosing something else than praying. Yeah. At that particular moment. That's why when there's a crisis, you're ready to pray. You know why? Because at that moment right there, that's your strongest inclination. Yeah. Huh. It's not about having a struggle with that, with prayer. It's your priority. Because the reason we don't pray more is because we don't want to pray. Okay? Look at the person sitting right next to you. Tell that person, he's talking about you. <laughs> yeah. Because we don't want to pray. That's the thing. Amen? Let's all be honest. Yeah. Including me. Amen. <laughs> you understand me? Clay? That's why my wife, she intercedes a lot. Because she wants to pray. I want to sleep. I want to watch the game. At that particular moment, the strongest inclination is pray, watch the game. You know, especially last five minutes when let's read, let's pray. No, no, let's finish the game. How have you been in that position before? Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> Our Lakers fans, you're praying, I know. <laughs> you're not gonna win. <laughs> we need to pray? <laughs> no, that's not a corporate prayer. <laughs> I don't agree. I don't agree in that corporate prayer. So there's a lot of Lakers fans in this church, I just want to say. I don't know, the disappointment after disappointment, but there's still a thing. <laughs> Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> if we're not praying, it's because we, be, we believe that whatever we are doing is more important or more desirable than prayer. That's why it shifts during difficulty because now you need to pray. Number two, what does it mean to be devoted in prayer? It's this. It is our first response, not our last resort. Interesting. All the examples that I gave you, that was their first response, not the last one. Because for most of us, here's what happens. Prayer is the last resort. Something happens, you still do it on your own. And then when you have nothing, that's the time you pray. But for these people, you study the Bible, it's always been their first response. Difficulty, pray. Celebration, they pray. Great things are happening there, pray. Why? Because you're giving glory to the Lord. It's not you. Challenges, pray. Come on now. Yeah. You're going through some situations in your family, you pray. But the problem is that is that what happens. You're going through situations where you're in your family, you talk to different people. You know, my husband's like this. You know, my wife is like this. You know, no, 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 no. If you have just channeled that energy into prayer. Wow. Heaven will be opening yeah. to the amount of time that you have talked and talked and talked and talked to others. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Maybe you just grab some people to stand in prayer with you. Yeah. There are going to be more better results. Amen? Yeah. The first response. Not attempting to solve the problem and then we ask God. It's like creating a mess, and then after that, Lord, uh, by the way, um, uh, Lord, can you help me? I don't think so. God's still going to help us. So the first response, the first church, the New Testament church, rather, the first response was to pray. And here's the last one. And I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. It's not there on the screen. being devoted to prayer. It's not focusing yours. It's about focusing on others and not yourself. That's number three. What do I mean by that? 
So look at Jesus. This is Jesus, and you read it in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 5. And here's what he said. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street's corner to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. This is Jesus saying, this is when you pray. Yeah, this is one of those. Matthew 6, I'm sorry. My bad, my bad. Everybody's looking at me. What is he reading? Matthew 6. Verse 5. There you go. That's why I got confused a little bit there. Matthew 6, verse 5. All right? When you pray, it'll be like the hypocrites. Again, what's that? When you pray, it's still about you. You love to, well, yeah, you're a show off, basically, what Jesus said. This is not how you pray. This is the difference. Again, what is being devoted to prayer? Thinking about others, not you. So when we pray, if the focus is you, you're going to be like this. You're going to be a show off. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? So look at this. They love to be praised standing in the synagogues and on the streets corner to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they are receiving food. So they, you, want, you, want, you want people to see you pray. You're like, you're bragging. You know, sometimes when you pray with others, you're like, wow, you're using all of those. You know, hallelujah, Lord, for your kind of glory. God, that is in this presence, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're moving and touching. And then, what's she kind of? I don't know. I just heard that from someone. <laughs> And here's the other one. But when you pray, do not go into the room. Go into the room, rather. Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done is in secret will reward you. And here's the next one. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. What is Jesus saying? Babbling, repeating words. You're repeating, repeating, repeating words. is because, again, you think that the more words, the more you're going to be heard by God. The shortest prayer was what Peter, Lord, save me, when he was drowning. He didn't pray the Lord's, you know, the Lord's prayer when he was drowning. Imagine that you're drowning, drowning, and you're praying. The Lord, our Father, our in heaven, and then the kingdom come. By the time you finish, you're dead. That's why he said, "Lord, save me," because that's the shortest prayer because he needs to be saved. And then look at this: Do not be, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And here's what it is, verse nine. We know this, this is the Lord's prayer. This is then how you should pray. Hmm. And we know this, and here's the first one. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's stop, what's the first word? Our. Our, Our. not mine. It didn't say, my Father who is in heaven. Our, Our Father. You're thinking about other people. Usually prayer is about you. No, my God, not you. You're amazing. And again, you start with about focusing away from you and magnifying who God is. You want your prayer to be magnified, powerful? Take the focus away from you. Look at this. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That means not your will, but His. Not you again. Of course, we did a series about this. I'm just giving a quick. Okay? Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And then it goes, give us today our daily bread. The want prayer? Not just thinking about you, but thinking about others. It will change your prayer. When you start praying for others. That's what they did. Because I am, to be honest, we are all full of ourselves. I am full of myself. That's why I need Jesus to remind me that it's not about me, but it's about Him. Amen? Amen.